each and every one of you here this morning. If you're visiting with us, we just want to let you know that you are honored guest and that we hope and pray that the next opportunity you have to come and be part of us, that you come back and uh, worship with us again. We would love to have you back. I want to ask you um, for some assistance. I'm about to be starting a new GBN program that I have entitled The Logical Truth, where basically what I'm going to be doing is trying to unscramble all of the confusion that is in the religious world today and making sense of it and making, making it where others can see truly how logical the truth really is. And uh, we're going to be, I'm going to be starting with a few lessons on authority, and I would love for you to help me with this. What I would like to ask you to do is that if you have had some interactions with individuals about religious authority, and you start noticing how people have certain type of confusions in reference to religious authority, or maybe you might think of some in your own minds of, of some things that maybe either you've come across or maybe you might have yourself some confusions about authority. Please write those things down and give those to me. I'm, I'm making my lessons right now. And so if you would not mind, would you please help me with that? I would, I would graciously uh, be very appreciative of that. As what we were already talking about, our VBS starts this Wednesday night. And our theme is that I cannot wait to see the King. And so the lessons on Sunday morning besides Father's Day are going to be lessons that are going to be revolving itself around our theme to try to help us in our own minds with the, with the whole thought of I cannot wait to see the King. This morning I want to discuss with you for a few moments loving His appearing. Now this all comes from 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 8. Where there Paul says, finally there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. But watch what else he says. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Now to start really getting down deep into it and just asking a simple question right off the get-go, what are we actually talking about? What does this mean to love his appearing? Well, when you start looking at the word appearing itself, we're talking here about Jesus' manifestation or his future advent, where he's going to be coming back the second time. That's what we're looking, talking about. Now, is that something that we need to be looking forward to? Well, we're going to be talking about today some reasons why we need to be looking forward to that event. When you're talking here about loving his appearing, it actually has reference to the longing and looking forward to the time when Jesus will come back for his people. Now, this is something that he has said all the way through uh, his ministry, that even though he's going to die, he's going to be resurrected. He's going to be sitting at the right hand of God in, in Acts chapter 1. But also through that, he also says in other verses, such as John chapter 14, what we're going to be talking about here in just a few moments, he says that if I go to prepare a place for you, what does he say? I will come again. And receiving to myself, how comforting that really is. He said, it's very advantageous for, uh, for me to go so I can come back for you. Now, it's interesting to know, as we begin our lesson this morning, we can rest assured and be fully confident in the fact that he will be coming back. Numerous verses that we can easily go to, like what we were just reading there in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, where he says there, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Now, I don't know about you, but this is very comforting for me. In knowing that our Lord has gone up to heaven to prepare a place for you and me and to all the individuals that will ever put on his son in baptism, those individuals that will walk the, the faithful life all the way to the time they die, 
where they will then have a place waiting for them, a place of rest, a place where redemption has now been taking place in its fullest extent, a place where you will be home forever. I go to prepare a place for you. And I'm not just going to prepare a place. I will return to take you home. Is that not something, brethren, that we need to be looking forward to? On top of that, not only can we be uh, assured that Jesus will be coming back because he said it. When you look here in Acts chapter 17, God said that he even confirmed it. And how did he actually confirm it? He says there... Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Why? 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 He says, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all. How? By raising him from the dead. Here's the whole point. As assured as we can possibly be that our Lord and Savior was resurrected on the third day according to the scriptures, we can rest assured that there was going to be a second coming of Christ and he assured that through the resurrection. That if he was truly resurrected, we can have assurance that he is going to come back again, that there's going to be a coming, a day that he is going to judge the world in righteousness. Whenever you look at what Paul even said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 through 9, we read there this. And to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Now watch this. In flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Paul affirms that Jesus will be coming back and he's going to be coming back with his angels and he is going to be coming back with vengeance. Now, it is it not important for us to realize that when Jesus comes back, there are going to be consequences that are going to be met. Is it important for us to realize that? Absolutely. So therefore, we need to be ready. James even confirmed this in James chapter 5 and verse number 7. Where we read there, therefore be patient, brethren, watch this, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the, uh, the precious fruit on the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. Just as a farmer himself waits for his crops, he does not immediately expect it to be the case that as soon as he plants it, he's going to have produce just like that. It doesn't happen like that, right? You've got to be patiently waiting for it. And just as a farmer patiently waits for his crops, he says we need to be patiently waiting for the coming of our Lord. When you think about what the Apostle John said in 1 John chapter 3 and verse number 2, we're reminded where he says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is, watch this, revealed. Revealed from where? Revealed from heaven. Now watch this. We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. My friends, it's important for us to realize the fact that Jesus will be coming back. Now, here's the question we have to ask. Has he come back yet, yes or no? He has not. Why hasn't he come back? Well, <laughs> we're still here. <laughs> but we do know for a fact that since we are still existing, that we are still on this earth, that the earth itself has not been burnt up yet, that the future of the coming of the Lord is still in the future. When is that going to be taking place? We do not know. One thing that we do realize, though, is that there in, in um, Matthew chapter 24 and verse number 36, we read there that of that day and hour knows no man. It's going to be just a regular day, just as it was in the days of Noah. Whenever he was preparing the ark, he was preaching for 120 years. The next thing you know, the Lord shut the door. As assured as it was during those times, assured we can be that that day is going to be coming. Now, I've got to ask this question. Why should we be longing for his coming? Well, when you look a little bit deeper into this, there are some things that we are looking forward to because of what's going to be taking place on that day. 
According to our text in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 8, we read this. Finally, watch this. There is laid up for me the crown of righteousness with which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. Now, I want to ask you a simple question. Are we longing for that crown of righteousness? When you think about the crown, and even James even talks about there about the crown of life. What's the whole point of this? The crown is a representation of being victorious. Now you have now gained your victory. Now you have now received the crown of righteousness that we have been found to be right in the sight of God. We then came through obedient faith, lived a righteous life, and therefore God says, on that day I will give you that crown of life. It's something that we need to be looking forward to. In Romans chapter 8, in verse number 23, we read there in that whole entire chapter, he's talking there about suffering and how even though we have our salvation, spiritually speaking, our bodies have to go through persecution. And he was going through a long list of things throughout that chapter and saying that we long for this. He uses the word creature as a personified thing about our physical bodies. But the interesting point is this. Our bodies are suffering in this life. Now, I, I don't know about you, but how many of us have daily pains that we walk around with? How, how many of us have those aches and those how many of us have ever stubbed our toe in the middle of the night? How many of us have arthritis where we wake up in the mornings and it just hurts? I see some people doing this little number, okay? Are you ready to lay this body at rest, yes or no? I'm tired of death, I'm tired of pain, I'm tired of tears, I'm tired of anguish, I'm tired of torment, I'm tired of... I'm afraid, though, that it's going to be coming here pretty soon, that we're going to actually start suffering physical pain for Christ in this nation. My friends, when it comes down to that, you are longing and hoping and praying for Christ to come. My friends, listen to me. In Romans chapter 8, he concludes with this, that at the second coming of Christ, in verse number 23, he says, not only that, he says, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we. Now, he's all, now he, not only is he talking about Christians in general, now he's including now the apostles themselves because they were going through some great persecution then as well. They were being scourged and beaten and things of that nature, thrown in prison. They had those physical ailments that were going on in their lives. He says, even we ourselves groan within ourselves. What? Eagerly waiting for the adoption. What? The redemption of our bodies. I know our souls are saved right now, but I cannot wait for my new body. Amen? I cannot wait till my physical body does not have to be persecuted any longer. That we don't have to go through those suffering trials any longer. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in that resurrection chapter, we are told there that on that last day that our bodies will be resurrected. And on top of that, our bodies will be changed. Because our earthly bodies cannot pass into the spiritual and therefore our physical bodies must be changed. And because of that, brethren, I cannot wait till that day. Why should we be longing for his second coming? Because, friends, remember how in, in 1 Peter, Peter calls ourselves as Christians sojourners and pilgrims. Now, we sometimes sing that song, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through, right? My treasures are laid up where? In heaven, somewhere beyond the blue. Now, we are just pilgrims going throughout this life and because as a matter of fact this world is not my home as a Christian where is our home our home is in heaven and if our home is in heaven my friends let me tell you Paul put it this way for in this we groan earnestly watch this desiring to be clothed with our habitation which is from heaven 
Our citizenship is in heaven, amen? And if our citizenship is in heaven, we cannot wait to be clothed with our habitation. Paul even put it in Philippians chapter 3, this right here. Because of our citizenship being in heaven, we cannot wait for this earthly life to pass. That day, whenever he comes back, is going to be a glorious appearing. Because guess what? All physical things will have passed. Our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm ready to go home. How about you? I am ready to go home. He also put it this way in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. In talking about the second coming of Christ, he's comforting the brethren there, and he says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Now, I know that if I was to ask this question, every single one of us could raise our hands. How many of us have had good, strong, faithful brethren that you are very, very close to go on home that have passed from this life? Every one of us has. How many of us have ever had loved ones who were faithful Christians or those who died before they were held accountable knowing full well they're in paradise? How many of us are truly longing to be reunited again? My friends, on that day we will be reunited. On that day, not only will we be reunited with our loved ones who have passed on before us who are faithful to God, but on top of that, we will also be able to be sitting around the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all the previous ones who had ever lived before. Are you looking forward to that day? To be able to sit down with Moses and be sitting there with all the righteous individuals, all the ones that we've been reading all of our lives about and talking about their lives and things and you're like, man, I wish I could go and I, just, I could just ask them the certain questions. We will be able to live with them for all eternity. But not only that, let me tell you about the cherry that's on top. My friends, we will meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. How many of us long to be with our Lord for all eternity? How many of us can finally say that I'll be able to stand in the presence of my Lord and Savior forever? To say thank you for everything. Are you not looking forward to that day? Those who are loving his appearing. To a Christian, those who have eagerly waited for him. The Hebrew writer says in Hebrews 9 verse 28. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time. Now watch this. Apart from sin. Now, it's interesting to note really what the Hebrew writer is talking here. Sometimes whenever certain phrases are used, whenever he says apart from sin, he's talking about apart from the sin offering because it's already been paid. He says, I'm going to be coming a second time apart from the sin offering for salvation. I've already paid the price. You've already paid yours. And I'm here to take you home. Are you not looking forward to that day? And you even think about what John wrote in Revelation 14, verse 13. Then I heard a voice from heaven 
saying to me, Right blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. We have been battling with that armor of God for so long. We're finally able to lay our armor down. Never to have to pick it up ever again. Does that not sound beautiful? Loving his appearing. We finally have rest. But I've got to ask this question. Since our Lord is coming back, we are confident of that. And now we have talked about how we need to be longing for that coming for certain reasons. Now I've got to ask this question. Are we ready for his coming? Because, you know, the prophets themselves, even in the Old Testament, the Israelites were screaming out, Lord, please come. We're ready for you. And at the same time, the, or the prophets said, you don't want him to come. You really don't because it would be very unprofitable for you. Why? Because spiritually they were not ready. They had deceived themselves into thinking that everything was all right. They were ready for the judgment of God. And the prophet simply said, no, you're not ready. You don't want him to come. It's advantageous for him not to come right now. But let me ask you this. What are some qualifying factors for us to make sure that we are ready for his second coming? Well, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, looking back at verse number 6 through 8, going back to our text, he says this, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. Now watch what he says. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. He gave some qualifying factors of the reason why he is going to be receiving that crown of righteousness. And he says this is the reason why. Number one, I have fought the good fight. Not only have I fought the good fight, guess what? I have finished the race. You know what that means? He started in the battle. He fought the battle. He never gave up on the battle. And he finished that race all the way to the very, very end. He says, and therefore, this whole entire time, what did he say he did? I have kept the faith. You know what that simply means? That word keep means that you have protected, that you, hold, that you have been holding fast to. You have not let go and were released. You have not given We have to fight, we have to finish, we have to keep it. In Revelation chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, we are reminded there, the vision that John had, he said this. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, who are these arrayed in white robes? Because he's seeing a heavenly scene here, and, and he sees these individuals that are clothed in white robes. And, he, and the angel simply asked, who are these that are arrayed in white robes? Where did they come from? And I said to him, sir, you know. So he said to me, these, the individuals who were clothed in white robes are these. These are the ones who came out of great tribulation and watch this, and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Therefore, watch this, they are before the throne of God. And serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. He's given them a future type aspect. Of individuals who are actually going to be making it to heaven. And we're talking about the individuals who have washed themselves white in the blood of the Lamb. Now, what is he actually making reference to? If you look at Revelation chapter 1 and verse number 5, we read there that he has washed us from our sins in his own blood. Now, watch this. What does that mean? Washed ourselves in his own blood. Another term to do this is remission. Now, you have to look back and start applying at what point in time does that actually take place. Matthew 26, verse 28 says, For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many, now watch this, for the remission of sins. Now, it's interesting to note that at the sacrifice of our Lord, blood and water came out. 
There's a significance about that. Not only is it talking about a medical situation that's taking place, but it goes a lot deeper than that. The mingling of water and blood mixed together. He uses, he uses that aspect to then preach in Acts chapter 2 when Peter and the rest of the apostles, he says, repent and let every one of you be baptized. Now watch this. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. At what particular time do we have our robes washed white in the blood of the Lamb? When we simply humble ourselves in humble obedience to being immersed in the water of river baptism. Whenever we contact the water, there's not a single thing in that water that saves. It's the operation of God according to Colossians chapter 2 and verse number 12. You believe that God has the power to fulfill his promise. That whenever we go down in obedience, God then applies the blood in the water. And therefore, we rise to walk in newness of life because we have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Amen? Baptism is at the point in time we gain forgiveness or the remission of our sins. At that particular time is when we contact the blood of the Lamb. Not only do we need to fight, not only do we need to finish the race, not only do we need to keep the faith, but it all begins with being a Christian. Now, going a little bit further with this. Now let's talk about being a Christian. He also says in John 8, verse 31 and 32, he says that Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, that if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And notice what he says, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall what? Make you free. Free from what? Free from sin. Now you're talking about an individual. Now, going all the way back to what he's already said there in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, that he's, finished, that he's fought the fight, he's finished the race, he's kept the faith. It's interesting to note all of this is inclusive of keeping that faith. You abide in the word. Why? Because that's the doctrine by which man will be saved. Not only on top of that, not only do we abide in the word, but we also have to apply the word. Notice this in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7. He's writing to Christians here. For if we walk in the light as he is in the light. Now that's an application part, right? Now you're walking. Now you're no longer just reading things. Now you're applying those things to your life. And now you're walking in a particular way. He also says this, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, then there's some consequential things that take place. He says, because we do that, we have fellowship with one another. And watch this, the same blood that we were just talking about in Revelation is now also the same blood that is continuing to wash over us. Now watch this. Only those who read, study, and apply the word and walk in a certain way, walking in the light, he says, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses. He continues to cleanse us from all sin. Is it important for us to have the blood applied? Yes or no? Is it important for us to have that blood continually washing over us? Yes or no? If you don't have fellowship with Christ here, my friends, please listen to me. You will not have the fellowship hereafter all he's asking is to love him if you love me do what keep my commandments all he's asking is to know him first john chapter 2 verse 3 know that by this that we know that we know him if we keep his Commandments, But there is a warning, and we've already read the passage, but we need to make sure that we understand this. Going back to 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9, and to you, to give you uh, who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. Now watch this. He is coming again. Amen? He's going to either come for those of salvation, is what we just read there in Hebrews, or he's also going to be coming with vengeance. But he's also going to be coming with vengeance on certain individuals. Number one, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God. Now we just read what that meant, right? For we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Now you're talking about an individual who is a Christian, 
But if you don't continue knowing him, guess what? You are a fallen away Christian. But he also includes not only the unfaithful Christian, but also those who are not Christians at all. And he says, and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. What does it mean to obey the gospel? 1 Corinthians 15, the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection. How do we liken that? Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, we die to sin in repentance. We are buried with him in baptism. We rise to walk in newness of life. That there's a resurrection. That is how you apply the gospel of Christ. If you have not done so already, we need to make sure that we are making ourselves ready and obeying the gospel. If you're not a Christian, I want to ask you this. Why are you waiting? Since we are not sure at all when the Lord is going to be returning, why are we taking a chance? If you have never obeyed the gospel, I hope and pray this morning that you'll do so. I want to conclude with this. I want to conclude with what John said at the very end of the book of Revelation. Revelation 22 and verse 20. He says, And he who testifies to these things says, Surely I come quickly. And what did he say in response? Even so come, Lord Jesus. John was ready. But I've got to ask you this question. Since our Lord is going to return, are we ready? If you're not a child of God... Do you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Are you willing to repent of your sins, basically change your mind of, of going after your own will and now changing that to the will of God? Are you willing to do that? To say, God, whatever you have for me to do, that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to change my life. That's what you call repentance. Are you willing to publicly confess your faith in Christ, that you say that I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? If you're willing to do all those things, I've got to ask this question, why are we waiting? Ananias told uh, Saul that whenever he came to him, he says, And now why do you tarry? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Do we understand that in that text, when you get down to the actual original language, calling on the name of the Lord is simply this. What he was saying is that you've already done everything so far that God has told you to do. Finish it up. Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Do you want that this morning? If so, we can assist you. I want you to be ready, and we all want you to be ready for the second coming, because either way, he is coming. Christians, if you have obeyed the gospel in times past, that means you are a Christian. But are we staying faithful to the day we die? Are we faithful right now? If that is the case, that we are not faithful, my friends, I'm going to tell you this with every single bit of love that's within my heart. It's time for you to come home. Why? Because you're not ready for the Lord to come. Come home. If we can help you in any way, please come forward right now together we stand and we sing.